Good afternoon. Welcome to the 2021 Farm Journal Foundation Speaker Series. My name is Trisha Beal. I'm CEO of Farm Journal Foundation. And on behalf of our entire team, I want to thank you for joining us. Our theme for this year is building food systems that nourish the nexus between agriculture and nutrition. For those of us who work in food and agriculture on a daily basis, we understand that there is very much an interconnected relationship between agriculture and nutrition, but we don't always see this reflected in policy and the way that we serve communities and the implementation of programming. Our goal for this series and this season is to explore these issues through critical thought and systemic thinking. We want to thank the more than 20 university and student organization partners who are working with us to bring this effort forward, many of whom have taken this work into their curriculum. We're very excited about that. And the hundreds of students who are joining us right now from all around the world, your participation in this dialogue is critically important because you represent the future of food and agriculture. I've been asked to share a few logistical points as we get started today. First of all, this session is being recorded. Poll questions will be presented throughout, so please participate. And if you would like to ask a question, please use the chat feature. It's now my pleasure to pass the reins to my colleague and partner in this project, Roger Thoreau. He's going to serve as our series moderator. Roger is a renowned author, a seasoned journalist, and he's currently serving as scholar in residence at Auburn University's Hun Hunger Solutions Institute. All right, Roger, take it away to introduce our keynote speaker and our great panelists for today. Excellent. Hey, Tricia, thanks for that. Thanks for gathering us all together <clears throat> again for this next round of our speaker series. It's really exciting uh, to be back in the swing of things. Uh, just from the outset, really wanted to give a shout out and a thanks to the, the Deaton Institute and the University of Missouri for kind of embedding this program uh, in this uh, uh, and, and, and to be part of their Within Reach Zero Hunger uh, conference, which is really exciting. Uh, and so many students uh, from both colleges and universities uh, joining into that. Uh, and particularly the theme of today, uh, community, which will be exploring community, you know, both, you know, the community that comes from, from individual farms to writ large to our global, the entire global community that needs to be so involved and make this uh, conquering hunger and malnutrition finally to make that a, 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 an imperative and an urgency uh, uh, for all of us. Uh, and so for some of you students who kind of saw me an hour ago uh, uh, addressing that conference, um, you're getting a double dose of me, so sorry for that. Uh, but this is much less me and more for, the, for, for, for our great panel uh, that we have lined up. So this series will be highlighting the complex questions surrounding our uh, food system. Uh, so issues like where do agriculture, nutrition, and health, both human health and planetary health, meet? How do climate and nutrition connect? How can we understand each other's unique experiences with food and, and food, with food security and, and agriculture uh, and the primary importance of nutrition? And it's precisely at this nexus where we find our, our greatest challenge today. How do we both nourish the planet and preserve, protect the planet at the same time, how do, we leave, how do we meet the relentless demand for more nutritious food coming from an ever increasing and ever more popular and ever more prosperous global population as more people move into the middle class, hooray, while also safeguarding our environment and our biodiversity for the very act of growing food, the very act of nourishing us takes a toll, uh, takes a toll on our soils, our, our waters, our air, our climate, our, our, our animals, our pollinators, the habitats of everybody. Every living thing on this earth is connected by the global food chain. So the pressure that's growing on our global food chain and all pushing us closer to our planetary limits. So this success is gonna depend on all of us. We all have a role to play in meeting this challenge. As Trisha indicated, we can all contribute mightily uh, to this battle to final, finally conquer hunger and malnutrition no matter what we're studying, where our careers take us, no matter our skill set or our passion, each and every one of us can make a can make a vital difference. So it's not like COVID and this pandemic, where where where, where ultimately we we've, we've been waiting for and praying for people in lab coats and 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 toiling in research labs to come up with a vaccine and hopefully a, a cure. No, 
look at it. this issue, we know what needs to be done and how to do it. We need the public and political will to do it. And we need the determination of each and every one of us to contribute what we can and to make it this urgent imperative. So to hear more about this challenge and what we can all do about it, to both outrage and inspire us, we have assembled a terrific panel today. We've got Dr. Cedric Habiaremie, who's a freshly minted PhD in agronomy and crop science from Washington State University, and is the scientist who is bringing quinoa to Rwanda, his home country, and to other parts of Africa. Cedric serves as research associate at Washington State and a research lead at the Food Systems for the Future Institute. He's also an agricultural engineer, or an agricultural entrepreneur, where he finds time for that, co-founding a number of enterprises, including the, uh, the Quinoa Hub Limited. Cedric is one of the leading voices of his generation, raising the clamor about the need to end hunger and malnutrition as a senior new fellows, new voices fellow at the Aspen Institute and is the youngest member of the Agriculture Task Force at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, where I got to know him. Cedric has a most remarkable story to tell us. So we're really excited to hear that. As far as storytelling goes, fascinating and remarkable stories, so do Mike and Edie McMahon, who operate Easy Acres Farm, an 850 cow dairy uh, with an additional 750 head of young stock on 2,300 acres of land in Homer, New York in the central part of the state. They're an industry leader in environmental stewardship. Easy Acres was recognized as the 2018 United States Environmentally Sustainable Farm of the Year by the American Dairy Association. And Easy Acres engages with uh, courses at Cornell University and the Syracuse University School of Environment and Forestry, hosting students uh, on farm every year to learn about the farm's operations in two main watersheds, as well as being situated over a sole source aquifer. So what they're doing is, is so vital and a model than for so many others. It'll be great to hear from them. And then we also have Krista Harden, who's the president and CEO of the US Dairy Export Council, where she leverages her vast experience with agriculture, sustainability, food policy, and the federal government to promote dairy exports while helping dairy farms implement new practices and technologies developed to reduce dairy's environmental footprint, or hoof print, I guess we should say. Krista, as I mentioned, has, has just a phenomenal array and many years of experience working in both the private and public sectors at both multinational corporations and at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, as well as longtime service with the National 4-H and the Global Child Nutrition Found Foundation. All this from a BA in journalism, yay! So you see, we all have a role to play in ending hunger and malnutrition, no matter our skill set or background. It'll be a wonderful panel discussion. First though, we'll hear from Dr. Sally Rocky, uh, who is the executive director of the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research. Dr. Rocky has been a long and preeminent leader in federal research, overseeing some of the world's largest research programs in both agriculture and biomedicine. She has spent almost 20 years with the US Department of Agriculture and nearly a dozen years with the National Institutes of Health. All this from PhD in entomology. So, Dr. Rocky, over to you to get us started. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Great guitar in the background. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for having me. This is really a wonderful topic. And as you, you see, the intersection between agriculture and nutrition, as Tricia uh, mentioned, is often a little bit uh, confusing um, and not directly uh, connected. And so what we're trying to do um, in our foundation, as well as other places, we want to try to make a stronger connection between the nutrition of the food we eat and how it is produced. So I'm with the Foundation of, of for Food and Agriculture Research. Our mission is to build unique partnerships to support innovative science, addressing today's food and agricultural challenges, and there's many of them. Uh, you heard Roger talk about the idea of the ag environment nexus and how we must preserve the planet as we are um, also providing for the, the food for people around the world. So that is a big central focus of our foundation as well. 
And we envision a world where ever innovating and collaborative science provides every person access to affordable, nutritious food grown on thriving farms. And we do this, we're a very unique organization because we do this through private public partnerships. We are actually funded by Congress through the Farm Bill, but we aspire to have public-private partnerships and we're required to have public-private partnerships because we cannot spend our funding unless we have non-federal match. So that means that we look at the private sector, at other NGOs and um, uh, foundations, as well as other go government agencies and um, academic institutions to partner with to create this great innovation ecosystem that is uh, propelling science forward and really uh, progressing agriculture. So we have had many, many partners over the years. We we're about six years old. We started in 2014. We've had over 500 distinct funding partners. So we really get to take advantage of the great work that's going on across the entire sector. And in working together, we think we, we believe we can do far more working together than we can as individual organizations. So we do two things. We fund research, which I'll talk about in a moment, but we invest in the scientific workforce. I know there's a lot of students on the um, call here, and we really believe in that great talent that you have and that you will be the foundation of our future. So we do invest in fellowships and other types of programs that help students um, navigate their careers in agriculture and make them as best prepared for their careers as they can possibly be. And then we also fund pioneering research and we have six challenge areas. As I mentioned, one of our largest areas is that environmental um, agriculture nexus, which is really cutting across all of our, our um, uh, areas. But the topic of this discussion today is that health agriculture nexus, which I'm going to uh, give you a little background on and where we see some of the research going in this area. So I just wanted to talk uh, about the um, in the United States for a moment. Um, this is a, just a, a slide on um, food insecurity. And I will tell you that I am on a cross-cutting nutrition um, advisory group across the federal government. And we're sort of work moving away from the term food insecurity or food security to nutritional security. Because you can have access to food, but you may not have access to the right nutrition. So we're trying to change the vernacular here to talk about um, even though the slide says food insecure, about nutritional security. And that really has to be in the back of our minds. Um, so in, in the United States, uh, about 6.8% of the adults are um, uh, food insecure, but children also are food insecure. And there's also levels of insecurity that uh, we see in the United States. And if you look at what we eat, we think we've made a lot of progress in what we eat, but these are actually the dietary guard guidelines. And you can see, um, where we were in um, 1970 versus 2017 and how close we are to meeting the gu dietary guidelines with just this line right here in the middle. And you can see that we haven't really made a lot of progress in, in our diets here in the United States in meeting those dietary guidelines. We still have excess in meat and eggs and of course grains and not, we don't meet it in vegetables, dairy and fruit. But on the other hand, on one side, we have nutritional insecurity, but on the other side, we have obesity. And obesity is one of the most critical challenges facing the world. Almost a third of the world's population is obese. In the United States, you can see here that 42% of our population is obese. And it, obesity is a very complex um, question, but it's also about the food we eat and the um, access to nutritional food. So when we look at obesity, for example, we've looked at what are called food deserts, which we all know uh, food deserts where you don't have access to um, uh, nutritional food. And that can happen in oftentimes in cities where there's um, uh, uh, vulnerable populations. But on the other hand, a food swamp is where there is more unhealthy, there's not a good balance between unhealthy choices and um, healthy choices. And we actually see that, that having a food swap where you're, you have access to these unhealthy foods actually predicts obesity rates more than a food desert will. And the interesting thing about this, it, does, it goes across all socioeconomic levels and both high and low income. So that's a very fascinating um, uh, statistic to look at. 
So we really are, the, the title of the session is, is We Are What We Eat and We Are. This is a DNA molecule uh, or fr uh, fruits and vegetables dressed up as a DNA molecule. And it really means there's so much to us as individuals that how we um, can, what we eat and how that impacts our body is very, very personalized to us. So as Tricia had mentioned, there's an odd relationship between agriculture and nutrition. So agriculture and nutrition share a common ent entry point, of course, that's food. And food is a key outcome of agriculture and a key input into good nutrition. So food is that connector, correct? But the availability of food in agriculture uh, from agriculture doesn't ensure good nutrition. So there's a lot that more that goes in there. And on the other side, we say, should agriculture feed people or feed people well? We hope that agriculture is feeding people well, but that's where that connection to nutrition really happens is, is we have to feed people, but we must feed people well. And so there, there's common sense really dictates that uh, there should be this reinforcing relationships that be ag between agriculture and nutrition, but often there's a significant disconnect. And that's why we here at our foundation, along with USDA and many groups, such as the people that we're going to hear about on, here today from on our panel, work in that space in between. So one thing that people have talked about is the precision nutrition. And what is precision nutrition? It's developing more targeted and effective diet intervention based on a person's personal characteristics. And these are all the kind of things that you have within you, your um, how you metabolize food, what microbiome you have in your um, microbiota you have in your in your gut, you know, what are your dietary habits? What are your exercise habits? All of those things go into precision nutrition. And the idea is that we can, can uh, more accurately uh, control your health through prescribing specific types of diets that would improve your nutrition. So the question is, will precision nutrition work? And there's been a lot of debate and discussion about it. It can provide the right dietary interventions to the right population at the right time, but precision nutrition is an individually centered approach, focusing on behavioral modifications, right? And so is this likely going to work um, at a population level? The idea is that it could very much work about some of the most so more socially privileged populations, but taken alone, it may not work at the population level. So how do we come back to the overarching nutritional system and food systems that we have across this country and across the, the world that are going to allow us to address um, uh, nutrition at a population level. So um, there's two ways that we can do this. And this is really where the connection between agriculture and nutrition comes into play. First of all, we can improve the nutritional quality of the foods we currently eat. And so there's a lot of ways that we can do this. Um, one of the things that we are striving for now is looking for breeding for nutritional traits in food. So if you wanna increase protein, if you wanna have some more micronutrients, if you want to have um, uh, 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 some more essential oils and foods, you can breed for them. Now, breeding for nutritional traits is highly complicated because the traits, nutritional traits are, are really controlled by an enormous, genetic and physiological um, characteristics. So, um, but we are seeing now more and more work towards breeding for nutritional traits while at the same time, assuring that you um, are not reducing yield and are also allowing plants and animals that are resilient to environmental change and, and, and to the environment. So all of this is very complex. You probably have heard that there has been studies of whether or not increased breeding for yield has decreased nutritional quality in plants. So you have to make sure to balance that. Um, we have to also look at production practices and the impact of nutritional components. This is where the environment comes in. Um, they use the different kinds of soils, the different kinds of inputs that are used in the system, the different kinds of cropping systems, when it is um, harvested, what the, the um, uh, uh, transportation and processing does to nutritional quality. We have to look at that. So the whole um, on-farm agricultural system, as well as the extension past the farm to see the impact on nutritional quality. We can look at new ways to produce food. So for example, um, indoor agriculture offers an opportunity to make very, very um, uh, customized kinds of food because you can control every element about an indoor environment where you might be might be looking at 
uh, a light source may cause you to have increased nutrients of one way that you can totally control that whole population of plants by changing lighting. Um, I just mentioned impact of transportation and processing. And then we have to look at new formulations for foods. Are there different formulations that we can use that will improve nutrient quality of processed foods? So that's one way, improve the nutritional quality of the food we eat. And the second way really is to diversify agriculture to make available a larger source of nutritional food. And this is a, oh, an area that we have a very large initiative in. Um, do you realize that there's over 30,000 edible plants around the world? But only, th but however, three crops, rice, wheat, and maize, provide 50% of our calories, cover 40% of the arable land, for in the basis of our whole food system, it's mainly been derived from those three crops. Um, sometimes it has pushed more traditional crops that many um, farmers grow across the world to the margins, and it really doesn't um, appear sustainable. So for example, when you have monocultures, you oftentimes can get, um, for example, disease that could potentially make that entire uh, monoculture um, vulnerable. But we really believe that there are many, many nutritional traits within these 30,000 edible foods that if we could discover what they are and be able to get them into our food system, it would not only provide nutritional quality, but also provide for economic opportunity for the farmers that grow these, these uh, crops. So we are um, working on a project called Harvest for Health, which really is sort of like a science fiction big data project where we're trying to see if we can build algorithms that will allow us to better identify crops of interest that have increased nutritional traits and what is the potential for those crops to be put into the market. And so we have to look at the properties of interest, screen for identifying uh, promising crops, formulate and test them. We have to learn about cultivation. And then in the marketing, we have to figure out whether or not we can actually grow them, how they're stored, and um, what the consumer demand will all be. So the idea is really that if you could make a very, use artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning to take all of these data about traits of crops and plants across the world, that you'd have an easier time answering the question of which crops would be, have the most potential to give us increased nutrition and also to be um, viable for our um, system. So we, I, I've talked a little bit about what the science is, but we really do need to look at the profile of a wider variety of plants. We have to look at how the bioavailability is, is, is provided. And we also need to think about our entire uh, food system. If you want to connect nutrition and agriculture most, more closely, we have to model the entire food system because the food system, every little piece is very dependent on the other. And this is really what we learned with COVID, isn't that? Because what happened with COVID was these interconnections that agriculture has, if you have, um, if you are not able to process the food and certain food has to then be destroyed, if you have to destroy um, some corn or soybean, then the, the, the pork may not have their food, the food that they need. And all of these things are so intertwined. So COVID-19 exposed the vulnerabilities we have in the food system that allows us now to target those vulnerabilities and to, to make ourselves prepared for um, the next um, crisis that might occur. And that's how I'm hoping you're setting up the panel for a, a great discussion um, in the next few minutes. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Rocky. That was fascinating. I love the uh, love the fruit and vegetable DNA molecule. Uh, <laughs> very clever uh, and colorful, and really really can capture imaginations. And also, yeah, the the you're noting the shift from food insecurity to nutritional insecurity, uh, which I think then yeah makes it more uh, uh, perhaps more visceral and personal to people because I think it's maybe something we can relate uh, more to. So Dr. Rocky has gratefully uh, and graciously uh, uh, agreed to join us on our panel. Uh, and so we'll have many more questions for you. Maybe just briefly uh, to follow up on, on one thing, if maybe you can just introduce us to, to uh, uh, one of these public-private partnerships uh, that you've you know, been talking about and how they can be beneficial in kind of this new food nutrition agricultural nexus, particularly say in advancing research efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. 
Yeah, I mean, public-private partnerships are really important because it allows, um, of course, the public sector and the private sector to work together and makes data and results available generally to the public. We also tend to work in that pre-competitive space where there's obstacles for advancement and that affect the industry as a whole. So industry is willing to come together and um, work towards overcoming those obstacles to accelerate everything we're doing. But we have just announced yesterday, you probably saw our our uh, large um, public-private partnership to um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to have climate smart uh, practices deployed across um, our farms uh, in the United States and the world. And what this is, is another big data project where we're trying to take all the people and organizations that work in this space and try to build a platform by which we can share all of our data and our results so that we can accelerate things. And the idea, one of the things about public-private partnerships, academic researchers often get access to industry data and results and industry and data get access to academic results and things that they would otherwise not have. And this is going to be so important for this initiative because this is a ground up initiative that includes um, farmers because farmers are going to be testing our, our platform and, and feedback. And um, we have to have everyone agree to work together and share results. And so that's the joy of a public private partnership. You together decide on how you're going to move and what you're going to do, and then you do it together. So it's, it's really a wonderful uh, uh, type of model. Excellent. So thank you, Dr. Rocky. We'll get more into that uh, as we go along and perhaps some, some of the students or people listening and tuning in will have questions. So again, please send your questions into the chat box. Uh, Maddie is compiling them, we can all see them, so, and we'll get to them as we go along. Uh, but now, so that's a great lead into uh, the work that uh, Cedric, Dr. Cedric, delighted to call you doctor, uh, that you're putting into practice many of these principles that Dr. Rocky has just, has just described and talked about. So uh, Cedric, what made you choose to pursue your education and your career in agriculture, particularly right at this nexus of agriculture nutrition, planetary health. You know, as you know, many youths, especially in Africa, agriculture is the last thing that they want to pursue, having seen their parents struggle mightily to so succeed as farmers and as smallholder farmers. Uh, what's propelling you forward? And uh, uh, yeah, how, how, how have you arrived at this, uh, at, at, at this point of, uh, of great eminence uh, uh, and accomplishment so young in your life? Thank it? you, Roger. And, uh... Uh, yeah, it's uh, my passion and commitment to agricultural development and in the fight against hunger and malnutrition. Uh, they were fueled or inspired by my past. Uh, I grew up in a refugee camp and experienced the hunger and the starvation. Life was not easy towards a survival. Food became a real commodity. And there were times my family and I would go spend three or two days with nothing to eat at all, only drinking water from the swamps. And during those times of hardships, I was 11 years old that when I decided that if I survive, I want to become expert in agriculture so that I can find the solutions to make sure that nobody will go to bed hungry anymore. Because I didn't like to see people going through that. And I still don't like to see people going through what I went through when I was a child. So, and then I vowed that within my lifetime, I do everything possible uh, to create a system that advances, especially ecological farming and access to nutritious food that are locally and sustainably produced. So I know it, I faced a lot of, you know, in the school, agriculture portrayed as back-breaking labor that pays peanuts, but I knew that if we focus on developing that sector, it will create the wealth and the well-being of the people in Rwanda and the different countries in Africa and globally as well. So that's, it's basically, my upbringing is what inspired me to pursue my career into agriculture and food systems. You are on mute. 
So you think that by now, after all this time, I would have figured out, uh, I'd have an instinct to like unmute myself autom automatically. So here we are more than a year into this and I'm still, uh, anyway, I know from our past conversations that your family and particularly your mother uh, was really important and vital in, in uh, uh, kind of your transition, your, your education, your coming to the United States and then in this. Can you, can you talk a, bit, a little bit about her and, and kind of the impetus of, of, uh, of, of the family uh, and particularly your mom? Yeah, so um, when, when we were through those hardships of hunger and starvation, especially, you know, the trauma of the genocide and all that, you know, we lost the hope. That was no hope of living and, you know, I lost my dad. And then that time I was so desperate, my brother and I, to the point that I was like, life has no meaning. And my mother saw the despair in our eyes and she said, as you are desperate, but this is not the end of your lives. This is, I see a lot of potential in you. You are the future of this country. You can save the world. You can change people's lives. And I was so upset because those words didn't make sense to me because you're talking about future and saving people's lives. And I couldn't save myself. Uh, we lived at the present moment. and. The, even the future was abstract. You didn't know you survived tomorrow. And I was upset. I left the room and she pulled me back. She said, I see you are upset, but the only way, way to become who you want to become and to make an impact you want to make in this world is to go to school and study. And I was like, she's talking about future again in school. So I left the room and went to cry. But later on, my brother came to reassure me and we came up with the plan and then I decided to go to school, which was very hard and expensive, were expensive that time. School fees was like 25 cents a quarter, but we couldn't afford it. Then I started a small business at 11 years old and they managed to pay school fees and excelled in school. Of course, going to school with an empty stomach, hungry, it was hard learning by memorization because we didn't have enough Material, you know, enough money to buy the school materials. And I made it. Here I am. I got my PhD degree in agriculture at Washington State University. So it was a quite a journey. But I, I, the lessons I learned that when you believe in the beauty of your dreams, they become true. Yep. Excellent. That, no, that, that's such a remarkable and heartwarming uh, story. And such a model to like this this whole notion that that particularly in in ending hunger and malnutrition that we all have such a role to play in there even though maybe we can't imagine what it is if we think about it uh, and this passion begins to grow in us uh, there are ways kind of no matter what your skill set or what your passion is and so you're such a model of that I also wanted to follow up uh, uh, kind of before we move to to Kristen and Mike and Edie uh, so why quinoa uh, why introduce that crop in particular to Rwanda and other countries in Africa, because uh, I think that really speaks to this whole nutritional uh, aspect. Yeah, quinoa, quinoa is the case in point because it addresses both short-term and long-term nutritional food security. Like for example, the family, farm families can eat the leaves, the leaves are edible and while they can also waiting to harvest the grains. And it's a very, it has a, all the nine essential amino acids that makes it a complete protein. And the good, other good thing is that it is easy to grow and doesn't require heavy input and very climate resilient. Hmm. Um, in Rwanda, when we introduced Kino and for the very first time, we had the, we were concerned about the adoption and the consumption, but farmers embraced it to the point that one of heartwarming stories that they always tell me like having quinoa in the field, I can't go hungry because I will go snap leaves and cook it or boil it and have something to feed my family. And actually to go back to that, when I was, my interest in love in quinoa is because in 1997, we survived hunger in Rwanda and the only thing that kept us alive was beans hmm. because actually you can't go hungry when you have beans in the field you can snap the leaves 
eat uh, the, the leaves or green beans and dry beans like that. In fact, Rwanda is number one country, uh, beans consuming country per capita. Exactly. That's, that's how, and then I realized I wanted to find something that can play an alternative role or is a role similar to the beans because of course we need rotation. So that's why, why I did Kino. And the fun story is that my mother has been my cheerleader of all the time. She's now, her nickname in the community is the Queen of Kino. She started, <laughs> she started the, the Kino, uh, you know, uh, uh, extension programs giving this, I gave her seeds and then she's distributing the community and we have a network. So far we have around 500 farmers, more than 500 farmers growing Kino and consuming it. So it's really important. And I think it is about time that agricultural policy and investment to think, to focus on including an expanded focus on nutrient rich but neglected crops, most of which are native to Africa. No, quinoa is not the only, the only magic crop. There are so many other crops that will help in creating that, making nutritious food available and accessible for everyone. And in fact, maybe here I would like to also acknowledge and extend my our gratitude to uh, Dr. Rokis and her foundation, their recent support in our Kino research at Washington State University. We are very grateful and we need more support, people like them, uh, the, uh, Rocky and her foundation, who believes that to address this issue of malnutrition, we need to invest in the nutrition, nutritious rich crops because nutrition, food security should be seen in the lenses of public health yep. from now on. Oh, absolutely. I knew there was, 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 was a more concrete connection between you and Dr. Rocky and her word, work. So it's great to have you guys paired up on this panel, uh, why I had you follow each uh, <laughs> other. And great to hear about your mother and kind of paying her back in essence for all her trust and belief in you. And you have now elevated her to the status of queen in the community. So or queen of quinoa. So Bravo for bravo for that. Mother helping Thank son, you. son helping mother. That's great. Uh, so we get we get heartwarming stories out of all of this scientific and, and analytical and research uh, things in this discussion. So thanks so much for that, Cedric. And we'll come back to this. And somebody just put in into the chat box. You mentioned other crops and indigenous crops. They mentioned moringa, uh, and uh, kind of the importance of, of that crop and what people are doing with that. So we'll talk uh, more about that. And I'm sure people will have other questions on that. Uh, so Krista, uh, uh, let's go to you and then we'll go to Mike and Edie as we get into the dairy uh, side of this. Uh, so Krista, so the dairy industry has long emphasized the nutrition and health aspects and benefits of its products, but now it's also having to prove how farmers can operate sustainably, uh, lessening dairy's impact on the environment. What's been driving this movement uh, and kind of what progress has been made and what, what more you know, are we looking forward to being done on this? Thank you, Roger. It's good to be here. And I first want to just thank everyone, um, especially our students who are joining. And I just encourage you to participate and get involved in these types of dialogues. Your curiosity, the questions you ask, the ideas you have, the better educated you are, the more diverse solutions we're going to find all these questions. So I'm, I'm really proud to know that there are, there are a lot of students involved. And I appreciate um, us really thinking about ag nutrition and health. I think that's just a perfect intersection for dairy and I think you'll hear that from our dairy farmers about how we do go about thinking about sustainable nutrition is a, a phrase that we use a lot around dairy um, about being good for people, good for community and good um, for the environment. And you asked why we do that. There are a lot of reasons. First of all, dairy farmers are great environmentalists. I think they care very much about natural resources. They care about their operations. They care about their impact. I mean, there are communities um, and not in all aspects. So I think it's a logical place for us. We also know consumers care and they're more and more interested um, in discussions like this, knowing where their food comes from and how it's produced, who's producing it. So it's delightful to have two dairy farmers today. You can see them, you know, real live people who make a living, who work very hard, who make tough decisions. These are award-winning folks. I mean, I've I've known about them for a very long time and the work they do. Um, and I think, you know, telling that story about um, dairy is not just good for you. 
um, it does make a difference and so much in, in a good, healthy diet, but uh, it also can be a part of an environmental solution as well. We also work in the dairy industry um, with Dr. Rocky and her team. Uh, we have a, a relatively new research project that's just, we're coming together to look at field and um, feed production and collecting data that's just not available. We've got to be able to prove out what we say and what we want to do. So I appreciate for us, um, again, that partnership with industry like dairies. It's just so helpful to bring these partners together to answer some of these tough questions. And, um, and I'll just close by saying someone gave me uh, a, a little handwritten placard that I keep that says good health um, comes from the farm, not just the pharmacy. And it, it really, it was years ago when I got this and it was at a, a farmer's market in Memphis and um, a, gr a group of nutritionists and teachers and retirees were there trying to teach folks in an inner city about you can be healthy, um, you can be more healthy, you can get nutrition from your food and what you eat, it does matter. And I think that's what we're all trying to talk about is really where those intersections are uh, for good health, for good nutrition and how we get as agriculture um, can help promote and educate. So I look forward to the discussion today and I'm pleased to be a part of this dialogue. Excellent. So thank you, Kristen. And yeah, we'll get more, more into that. And I'm assuming uh, have a hunch that the students will also have, you know, questions on this because there's been a lot of talk about the role of livestock uh, uh, kind of in going forward in, in our new food systems and, and, and it's part of the food system summit and the liberations that are coming up, but then also the, 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 the vital importance of animal source, uh, protein and in nutrition and, and, you know, the, how does then, then one mess these two going forward? Just also wanted to follow up then before we get into the McMahon's that you're the president and CEO of the U S dairy export council. Uh, so like why the need for, for export? Doesn't that, isn't, isn't that like running counter to the whole eating local notion, which has been one of the principles of the planetary health uh, movement and a lot of talk around this. Uh, so kind of where does export uh, come in? And I know you have a great example of this from kind of recent, recent events uh, in, in Texas, I think you were talking about that I think would be really enlightening. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think that a lot of folks do think that local is the only way. And if you can, you know, source some of your food or all of your diet from um, locally, um, I think that's great. But it's extremely unusual that you can get everything you want and need in your local community, whether you live in a rural area, you're living in a suburban or uh, urban area. There are things you like to eat or want to eat that come from other places and depending on the time of the year. You may want something fresh that you're not able to get, you know, locally. Um, the story you're referencing, Roger, it was just kind of off the cuff when we were chatting about things that had just happened. Um, many folks are aware that Texas suffered an unusual um, ice storm um, late in the year for them. Never have they had such devastation, or at least a very long time. And in talking with farmers, some of them just said, I'm so glad my local community is not depending on me to feed it. I couldn't do it this year. My crops are iced out and I don't know when I'll get back in the field and what damage I will find. And it just, it just hit me. And then when we were talking about this, Roger, it really made me think that things like that happen all the time around the world. It, it's maybe not be an ice storm. It may be a drought. It may be a flood. It may be a, another natural cause, even though you want to feed um, your local community everything they might need. Sometimes it's just totally impossible. And to get that full nutritional value, we have to look um, out of our borders, out of our communities, often to do that. And of course, the crops many of us cannot produce because of soil types or weather, or climate, other issues that may happen. So it is not about one or the other in my mind. It is about finding that balance that helps all of us have a more nutritious and healthy diet, no matter where we live, where, what's produced and where we live. Yeah, great. No, it's a great story and, and, and an illustration of, uh, you know, Today's theme at, 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 at the, the Deaton Institute is, is community and how, you know, the, we're all part of this community. We're all connected on the global food chain. So you kind of rattle one part of it and, you know, kind of shakes through, through the whole uh, system. So now Mike and Edie, McMahon, your work on Easy Acres really brings to life a lot of these things that Krista uh, is, is talking about. She's referenced you a couple of times as, yeah, you guys are the farmers on the ground kind of making sense of this or trying to put it all together. What brought you guys to this nexus, thinking environmentally 
uh, and leading the way on implementing sustainable farming uh, practices on the dairy. Well, Roger, it was, it was interesting how it came about because um, 25 years ago, um, we were milking in a number of locations in old facilities uh, around throughout our community. Um, because uh, when my dad was alive and running the farm, he uh, would buy these farms as they would come for sale. And, and, um, and he always said, I can buy a farm cheaper than you can build a barn. So we would have, uh, we would have all these old barns that we would, as the herd would grow internally, we would move into another barn, another barn. Well, by 1995, when, when we were running the business, we bought it in, in 86 from my parents. Um, we were uh, milking cows in four locations in old facilities. And, and we knew that because of the inefficiencies, we either had to um, find a new career or, or modernize and consolidate. And so we did, uh, we, we built a new, um, a new setup uh, uh, and, and it was really a consolidation much more than it was an expansion. And when we were building our, our new uh, facilities, um, the neighbors, and we live, we have a lot of subdivisions very close by. Uh, Homer is, if you find it on the map, you'll see we're just about uh, equal distant from uh, cities of Syracuse, Binghamton, Auburn, uh, Ithaca, and people like to live in Homer. We have great schools and it's a great community and work elsewhere. So it's a bedroom community. We do have a lot of non-farm neighbors. And, and we heard uh, the grumblings in the, in the diner uh, that, oh my God, the McMahons are building this, this huge barn uh, right over the top of our sole source aquifer. And, and uh, gosh, what's gonna happen to our, the cleanliness of our water. And, and so uh, that kind of hit home with us that, that we needed to uh, up our game. And so, um, and it was just about the same time that Dr. Danny Fox from Cornell University um, started uh, Animal Science 412, which was uh, uh, Animal Science in the Environment. And that's the first time I think I heard the word sustainability thrown around. And they were looking for a case study farm that uh, had uh, the ability to impact the environment in a number of ways, which we do. And, uh, and also at the time, moving into a new facility, we weren't really quite up to speed with things. Someone who was ex experiencing some production issues. And, uh, and so uh, we became the case study farm for Cornell University. Um, it's, a, it's a plus and a minus where we live. We're only 27 miles from the college. So every time one of those guys over there gets a harebrained idea. They come right here with it. Uh, but, but that's also uh, a wonderful situation for us too, because um, we, we have access to them and, and uh, the professors over there are good friends. And, and um, so we've done a lot of work with them over the years. So, um, so in, in being the case study farm, it was suggested that we not only look at the changes um, to our operation in terms of how they impact um, the farm uh, in terms of financially sustainability, um, but also how do we impact our environment and, and our impact uh, to, the, uh, to the neighbors around us. So, so our farm, 70% uh, of our farm is in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. We're one of the northernmost farms in that watershed. Um, and 30% of our farm is in the Skinny Atlas Lake watershed, which is uh, unfiltered water supply to the city of Syracuse. So there's 240,000 people uh, drinking unfiltered water from Skinny Atlas Lake. And, uh, and beyond that, uh, our farm is located over the sole source aquifer for uh, the town of Homer and city of Cortland. So there's about roughly 25,000, maybe more people that uh, drink the water that's underneath our farm. And that's not enough. We also have two protected trout streams uh, running through our farm, one to the south and one to the north. So we have the opportunity to make life miserable for a lot of people if we don't do things right. And, uh, and that became very, you know, very much aware to us. And so uh, one of the things that was suggested by Dr. Fox was that we begin a water and well sampling project. So since 1997, 
we have uh, we selected five wells through the distance of the aquifer underneath our farm. Uh, two of them are our, our own wells in different locations. Two of them are um, private wells from individuals who allow us to, to sample. And the fifth well is the actual municipal well at the end of the aquifer where, uh, where the city draws their water from. And we pull these samples, oh, we also sample the two trout streams at the same time. We do this every three months and we've been doing this since 1997. And, uh, and we're looking at uh, the nitrogen and nitrates in the wells and the phosphorus levels in the streams. And um, so a couple of years ago, I was asked to speak uh, to Cobalt Skill College uh, in their environmental speaker, speaker series. And, and we decided to, uh, Edie said to me, what are you doing with all that data from all your well samples you've collected all these years? So I brought her about a three foot stack of paper. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so she set about uh, plotting all these wells and and looking specifically at the one at the far end of the aquifer where the water runs to, which happens to be the municipal well. Uh, we saw that uh, the nitrates in that well from 97 until 2000 went from 16 parts per million down to nine on a straight line um, reduction. And, um, and, and we think that that's because of the agronomic practices that we've instituted over the years to protect that water and, and, uh, and the neighbors that use it. And so coupled with that, uh, when Dr. Fox retired, uh, the HIP program got handed over to Dr. Kareem Cutterings. And, uh, and so she's, taken that program and I'll let Edie talk about uh, nutrient mass balance. It sounds complicated, so take it away. Um, take it away. Okay, um, it, in 95 when we were approached um, by Cornell, sustainability was new, you know, and it, that word has meanings, different meanings for a lot of different people depending on where you're coming from, but for us, it's, it's that finding a balance between the environmental stewardship, the social responsibility of being a good neighbor, and then you've got to have economic viability as well for the business. And so uh, nutrient mass, mass balance or mass nutrient balance, I, I'm confused sometimes, is the concept of making sure that you minimize, you, you recycle nutrients as best you can, uh, nutri uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium that all come at a cost onto your farm in the form of feed and fertilizer. Uh, you recycle those nutrients within the crop and feeding and production and fertilization cycle on the farm. And you minimize the imports, you maximize the exports of those things on your farm so that you prevent a buildup of excess nutrients um, on your farm and your soil that can impact your surface um, water and your groundwater. Um, and so in the process of doing that, um, we changed our cropping program. We moved to more long-term uh, grasses that hold the soil well, that uptake nitrogen very well um, as a uptake manure. Um, that provide a great feed for cattle, um, increased tonnages over the crops we were trying to grow before. We carefully soil sample and we really match our uh, fertilizer needs to the needs of the soil. So we've cut down a great deal on the use of um, potassium and phosphorus. And also uh, we reduced the, uh, through the work that our nutritionist who was doing He's still our nutritionist, but was doing his PhD work on our farm at the time, 23 years ago. Um, reduced greatly the amount of phosphorus in our dairy feed, um, which is the greatest source of phosphorus in coming onto the farm. Uh, with no, it was thought, you know, at the time that you couldn't reduce by 30% the amount of phosphorus you're feeding dairy cattle, or you would see uh, negative reproductive outcomes. We saw none of that. So, so through all these things, you know, we have positively impacted the groundwater. I think the well sampling shows that. Um, and so, you know, oh. we're sustainable, and our, our goal is to produce a high quality, nutritious 
you know, proteins and butter fat uh, for people. Excellent. Well, thank you for taking us through that because that's what I was precisely going to ask. Can you describe some of the things that you implemented? And I'm also wondering, and, and we'll soon get into questions and some are coming in specifically on, on the dairy practices. Um, what, what was all the cost of that or the economics of that is kind of these more sustainable, more of these environmental aspects that you're talking about. I, I'm just imagining that there's a certain cost to that that's above and beyond kind of the, 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 the normal cost of running a dairy. Uh, you know, given the situation that many dairy farmers across the country, the economic, you know, straits that they're finding themselves in, are some of these costs an, an impediment to some farmers uh, doing this? Or are they actually incentives uh, for farmers to adopt, to, to adopt these sustainable methods? I think, I think the, the beautiful part of this that there was there was very little cost to hmm. implementing some of the changes that we made. Um, and simply changing the kind of crops that we grow to, uh, on particular soils in the fact that we were reducing our fertilizer costs by not importing excess uh, nutrients, uh, the fact that our cows were actually healthier, feeding a higher forage diet. One of the goals is to produce more and more forage on the farm itself to not have to import feed. So cattle health was enhanced production, longevity in the herd, um, those things were all pluses. Hmm. Um, there was certainly there are compliance things that we needed to do as a, as a CAFO, a concentrating animal feeding operation, right. um, in storing manure, um, in capturing silage leachate, for instance, um, in building more storage for the grain or the crops that we were now were producing in greater quantity. Um, but fortunately, there, there has been government grant assistance for the, uh, many of those things. So uh, these practices were not costly to implement. They were leaps of faith, certainly, right. in some ways. Yeah. Well, that certainly comes with a psychic cost, I can, I, I can imagine, right? Uh, the leap of faith that, gee, is this the right thing to do, particularly on, on, on a family farm? And that's you know, kind of entrusted into your hands. Uh, so one of the questions we're getting from Jesse Teal, who's one of the wonderful grad students here at Auburn, he's just wondering that, you know, as dairy moves forward into these more sustainable standards, uh, you know, can that be done or will it create more legislation that, that you know, makes it even more difficult for, for, for dairy farms uh, uh, to make a go of it? Uh, you know, I'll start and, and I, I'm sure Mike and Edie can add to this at, at a different level. The whole goal is not to have regulation, is for farmers to be able to do this on a voluntary basis and to look at their own operations, look at their own soils or own, you know, um, climates and their own operations. You know, I've found that no two dairies are alike, even next door neighbors are not alike, siblings aren't alike, they, they just are different. So you have to tailor, you know, what makes sense for your own operation and that's the beauty of doing it yourself not waiting for a regulation, not waiting for someone in Washington or another capital city to determine what should be done, but you're doing it yourself, doing it just like the McMahons have done, looking at their own operation, what was feasible, what leap of faith they were willing to take, what risks they were willing to, to try to manage. Um, so I think that's what we're like to avoid is any kind of regulation that makes no sense on the ground. It's gotta be practical. It's mm -hmm. gotta make sense. It's gotta help dairies be profitable. And only the dairy family themselves really know what goes into that and what they can do and what the timeline might be to do it. They may have, you know, a long runway. Our goals that are set by this industry really gives us time to really see what makes sense on each dairy farm. And I'm sure Mike and Edie have more of a, a specific um, story to add to that. But um, it, it is not about regulation. It's about being doing this in a voluntary way. Right. Yeah. Mike and Edie, can, any thoughts that you have on that? Certainly, we do want to avoid regulation um, and make it voluntary. I think that um, what was interesting to see, we've been doing the nutrient mass balance now for uh, it was implemented in um, our imports and exports. Um, the most quickly 
really made progress by, by implementing these things, which were not complicated or highly technical. Um, so. Well, yeah, and um, so, yeah, the first five to six years was really uh, a matter of, of engineering, re-engineering the farm. And so, um, like you said, most of the changes took place uh, at that point, you know, for those first few years. And, and, uh, and, and there was seriously some, a, a leap of faith on our part. Um, you know, the, uh, the folks at Cornell were challenging us to um, look at the soils that we have and grow the crops they want to grow as opposed to trying to force a, a shallow sour hill soil to try to grow alfalfa and spend a ton of money on lime and field tile and everything else and end up with a crop that only goes, it's only good for two years and you'd like to get four or five out of it. So um, my dad, uh, when I was growing up, always said that if it wasn't corn or alfalfa, it must be a weed. So for us to go out and for us to go out and plant that first year, we planted 150 acres to grass. And, and so we said, well, here goes, you know, but, uh, but like Edie said, the result was uh, we were, we were pleased and surprised to see that um, we were able to uh, yield more tonnage per acre of grass uh, through four cuttings than what we were able to do with corn, mm -hmm. uh, which we never would have believed had we not uh, tried it. And, and also, uh, as she alluded to, it's a voracious sink for uh, liquid manure, for nitrogen. Uh, that's nice. It's up on the hills. It's away from the, from the community. And, uh, and so that's a help. But uh, yeah, so, so the re-engineering took place and, and that, as she said, resulted in uh, having to build more storage for our forage. And we basically went from uh, almost a monogastic type diet of a lot of grain and very little forage because we didn't feel that we had the land uh, availability to grow that much forage. And, and in that six or seven years, we flip-flopped it from 40% forage, 60% grain to now we're at 65, almost 70% forage and 30 to 35% grain. And, and the result is healthier cattle uh, fewer veterinary bills, um, a much uh, higher quality milk, you know, the, the protein and the butter fat. Um, we're up, uh, we're, we're all registered Holsteins, but they, they're milking like jerseys, you know, as far as the butter fat and protein. So, and feed costs greatly reduced. Feed costs yeah. greatly reduced. And that's the largest cost on a dairy farm. Right. He, my uncle was a dairy farmer in northern Illinois, so I'm delighted to hear this lingo because uh, it's part of what I grew up with. Uh, and so I've lost a lot of it, uh, but this is great to hear this again. This whole leap of faith aspect. I mean, Cedric, it's probably going through your mind because it's certainly a thing that I've seen with so many smallholder farmers in Africa. And you, I, I'm assuming that you you uh, are thinking that you also encountered this with, with quinoa and, and, well, here's a new plant. Uh, why don't you try growing that? Uh, that leap of faith of farmers to say, okay, I'm going to do this, not knowing, you know, even what it tastes like or what if there's a market for this, is it even going to grow here? Uh, can you talk some about that? And then somebody had said, you know, how, 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 how difficult is it then to kind of bring back some of these crops that are indigenous crops, say millet, uh, uh, you know, teff, uh, that's, you know, certainly a big crop in Ethiopia, but perhaps elsewhere, Moringa, so these other crops of, of then, you know, bringing them back into greater play, particularly in this goal of, of diversifying, uh, that Sally so also eloquently talked about, diversifying uh, nutrition. Yeah, I, I think it's always challenging. The adoption always it has to be associated with the market potential. It, it's a key. But for the case, for example, for our introduction of quinoa in Rwanda, uh, what we wanted, first of all, we wanted to, we started to evaluate if you can go even there. And then what we did, we didn't go, you know, we had to put in place farmer's voice, first of all, it did a needs assessment and feasibility study and to understand their needs. And we conducted the research in the plot, like within the community, where the farmers can see it and visit the field and we start, you know, kind of raising awareness. The biggest challenge we still, we are, the biggest challenge was like, okay, if then 
it grows there. They're going to be able to grow it, to accept it and bring part of their, um, their diet. One thing that made quinoa be a big part of their diet, like I said a little bit previously, uh, briefly, um, is that they love that it provides both short-term and, and um, food security uh, opportunity right away. So they can't go hungry if they have quinoa in their feed. A farmer is not, you are not going to tell them about nutrition. First of all, it's not like they're going to understand it number one priority. First of all, they're going to see if it's going, they're going to be able to, they're not going to go hungry. Right. So then the adoption became quicker and then the challenge was like, okay, now if they produce a lot, they consume it and they have some leftovers, what are they going to do? That's where I created a quinoa hub to create a market for those farmers, mm. quinoa producers. So that's why it can be fit in, but market is always has to, they go together. And for, um, I think in the chat, somebody who asked about, I think Kiruba asked about the rediscovery of underutilized small grains like millet. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm, Non, I'm known for mostly doing my work on quinoa, but I did also my work on millet as well. So since I moved in the USA for research, I came and, uh, and realized that millets are considered like bird feed, you know, in the USA pretty much. Back in Africa or Asia and some part of Europe, it's a staple food mm -hmm. and very nutritious. And then these crops are are actually disappearing in the farming community or they are receiving less attention. So then I started a research with my research team at Washington State University, it's called the Sustainable Seed Systems Lab. We started research on millet, how it can be integrated in the, uh, you know, rotational crop of the Pacific Northwest of, you know, the United States. And then later on, we, farmers start being familiar with it, but again, a farmer is not going to go and mill it if they don't have a market for millet. So then I conducted the research on uh, extrusion or food, food, food science part of the millet to see how we can create information that we, to inform food industry that what food product they can make. So now it's getting some traction and attention, but there are still some work not to be done. And um, the good news is that a month and a half ago, two months ago, the UN General Assembly of announced, announced officially that the year 2023 is going to be the International Year of Millet. So that's big news because it's going to bring maybe attention and maybe some research interest, but that's still a gap in these underutilized crops and most research and support goes to the bigger commodities. And that's the biggest challenges farmers in Africa are facing, affecting the, di uh, the diversity of their field. Exactly, and this gets precisely to one of the, the charts I think that Dr. Rocky showed of, uh, yeah, just the, 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 the majority of, of food and calories that we're consuming are coming from those three main crops. Uh, of what was it, uh, corn, wheat, and rice. And where's the role for all the, these other uh, alternative crops? We've gotten a couple of questions uh, that are, are specifically looking at this. So again, for anybody to, to weigh in on, but it's particularly for, uh, for doctors uh, Habi Yeremye and, and Rocky, that, can, and you can see this in the chat, uh, that considering the popularity of quinoa globally as a superfood, uh, and, and noting then the negative impact that that on, on the consumption by the local native countries, uh, Peru, uh, Bolivia, uh, and uh, you know caused by increased global demand for wealth populations. And I think I had seen somewhere somebody was explaining that yeah that when there starts getting this global popularity of it again you start seeing a narrowing in the various varieties of these crops because now they're going to start growing for export. Uh, and, and this is what the market is, is, is demanding, as opposed to all these other local varieties that may be there. So kind of any thoughts? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, well, and let Cedric 
respond specifically about what happened with quinoa there, but the idea is that the local communities who may have also believed it and used it as a superfood no longer have the same ex have access to it because it is being exported where the farmers can make more money. So when we're thinking about, for example, our, our this, this algorithm thing that we're trying to build, that has got to be a big part of it because you do not want to be, you want to make um, economic opportunity for the farmers from where, not only where the crop originates from, but um, allow it to be expanded without out competing those, those farmers who need it for their local communities. So it's very complicated because again, all of these things are interrelated and I don't think you know, with the expectation of what happened, I don't think we we predicted what would happen with quinoa, but perhaps we could use that as a lesson learned for future um, development of superfoods, as we call them. And Cedric, you might want to talk about more specifically about what happened there. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. From the time quinoa took popularity since the 2013, when the UNFAO declared the, the year 2013 as the International Year of Quinoa. And given its potential and in nutrition, as well as a, a, you know ad, a, a adaptability in different e ecological zones, and then in the fact that that is gluten free and high nutrition value, then countries, let's say United States, most of the mostly and the Europe, they started you know imp investing in quinoa you know, like import, and then back in where it is from, it became a kind of a cash crop, really, really, because there was high demand. But our research team, for example, at Washington State University, we have created what we call a global participatory quinoa research program or a quinoa research fund, where we are promoting, supporting research or creating research collaboration with the different countries in, around the world. So to make sure that quinoa is globally grown in a lot of places, not just in that particular area of South America. And then that will create enough production or access to quinoa grains or quinoa globally. And this is also goes in terms of uh, developing also uh, a network of researchers who are interested in quinoa to develop also varieties of quinoa that are specifically, for example, in our research team, we developed some varieties that are specifically adapted to the, you know, Pacific Northwest. And some, we are working with researchers to develop varieties that are specifically adapted to, you know, their countries and other places like that. But this is, we only have a greater impact if there is enough support system or funding support to develop those, you know, uh, tools or seeds that are ecologically specific to a particular region. But that's, yeah, it happened. And, but so far, because the, the let's say production at different local level in different countries, it's loosening up because now there is more marketplaces where people can source quinoa. Yeah, thank you. I think this is a, it, it's also a great lesson that, that moving forward is kind of all these things that we're talking about become implemented and, and kind of the swiftness and rapidity that we see, you know, with this, even with, you know, Mike and Edie and, and, and kind of how, how relatively swiftly kind of things move, uh, you know, on these changes uh, that it's always hard to anticipate uh, you know, kind of consequences from things, but the more that we can be aware of them, uh, because now we see that, the, uh, you know, kind of the impacts of the Green Revolution, which was so successful and absolutely necessary at its time in the 50s and 60s and knocking back horrible famine and saving, saving so many lives then, but we see the consequences of some of the practices of that with what's happened to kind of water levels around the world and soil conditions and, and from the monocropping that we've been talking about and this lack of diversity that going forward that we kind of, you know, see this and that this is also uh, front of mind. And I think part of that, one of the questions is, is that, um, you know, the, the more nutritious foods and as, you know, some organizations, you know, Krista, we were kind of talking about this that, uh, you know, in terms of the, 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 the status of, of, of livestock, 
uh, you know, going forward in this whole planetary health uh, concept uh, and movement and this kind of a, a, a diet for a healthy planet, healthy people, healthy planet, the sustainability of that, you know, that does, does, is, is, and then studies that have been done that that diet's not even affordable for so many people. So this notion of we're talking about nutrition and hooray for that, but does that also, you know, is that also, is that basically an option, you know, for the wealthy, like, you know, good health care in this country uh, and, and elsewhere. So kind of what concern do you have for that, that it, that, that this, it doesn't become something that is, uh, uh, yeah, more for the wealthy, but this is something that everybody can share. And Cedric, I think, is certainly seeing that in, in, in his community, in, in the communities in, in Rwanda and elsewhere in Africa, but even say on the dairy front and Sally, all the things that you're working with, uh, how do we ensure uh, that, that it does become affordable and then accessible to all, all these new nutritional uh, progress that we're making? I'll start this and a lot of other people that may want to chime in, um, Roger, I'll say that um, the answers are complex and they do vary from developing to developed countries and everything in between. Um, but in most cases, um, if a family owns a dairy cow and a dairy cow in some cases, yes. they can provide nutrition for their family and maybe somebody else's. And I think we have we cannot lose sight of that in many communities. And one of the, my most favorite memories, Dr. Cedric, was in Rwanda, meeting with um, female farmers, women, um, dairy farmers, and helping to convince them um, that it was important to feed their own families first, because the tendency was to sell the milk um, because it was such a valuable commodity, and then their kids didn't have that nutrition. And working with, at that time, the Minister of Agriculture and others I was working with from U.S. government in a partnership, um, just trying to, you know, have that conversation about how valuable it is to provide nutritious, healthy foods to your own family. That's one thing I think that is so important with dairy, that it can be one, one cow, a couple of cows, a few cows that really provide economic stability and nutrition for families around the world and other places like in the US, it can be bigger farms, um, obviously. So you have enough, not only for your own family and community, but for others. But you know, finding that balance, working through these complex issues in our food systems, not thinking that one idea, one solution fits everyone. And I, I think that we cannot oversimplify food systems. They are complex and they do vary country to country, region to region, and having farmers at the table, having those involved um, who to help make decisions, I think is so important. When I look at large convenings and, I, and when we're talking about these ideas, how critical it is to have the farmers themselves or what makes sense, have citizens from every communities involved um, in finding those solutions. Yeah, you know, and that's a really good point that uh, in terms of livestock, the relationship of farmers and communities to their livestock varies and differs so widely, uh, you know, around the world. Uh, you know, as Cedric would certainly know. I mean, that that a, a, a cow or a couple of cows uh, and calves, they're they're not only a food source. They're 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 the labor. They're, they're kind of the labor, the power uh, in the fields. They're mm -hmm. the social security for for the family, right? So it, it, it's it's far more uh, intimate relationship sometimes. Um, you know, that one has. Not that Mike and Edie wouldn't have, have that kind of relationship also with their, uh, with their cows. Uh, but yeah, you just see that, you know, that, that they're even inside the, the, the Tukuls in Ethiopia and, and, and in the farmsteads and so, and so close. So if anybody has any thoughts on that, that'll be great. And then kind of also kind of a last question uh, from, from one of the viewers from Tuskegee uh, is uh, uh, kind of the whole notion of food waste and food loss and how we uh, you know, how, how that kind of fits into all of this uh, as well. Uh, and then so kind of any closing thoughts you have on that. And then I want to make sure we have time to get into the last, you know, round of, of, of questions uh, and answers and, and just kind of advice challenges to the, to the students. But, but on kind of the previous question uh, that we were talking about on, on livestock, uh, animals, animal source protein, and then food waste or food loss. Anybody oh. can chime in. I just wanted to uh, maybe on my last comments talk a little bit about that egg environment nexus again and and Krista um, mentioned us just about the difference um, 
between every farm is different and every farm has opportunity here. But if you think about how this progressed and evolved over time, as you had just mentioned, Roger, in the 50s and 60s, when we went through the Green Revolution, now the Green Revolution was science-based, and this is why we hope that we'll have science um, to contribute and continue to contribute to the advances in agriculture. But if you think about it, it was advances in genetics and chemistry and, and advanced scientific methodologies that were applied to farms that led to Norman Borlaug received the Nobel Prize because technically his work saved a billion people from starving. So it was an incredible time. And so if you think about the progression of agriculture and its impact on the environment, you know, in the United States, agriculture produces about um, only nine and a half percent of all the greenhouse gases. So agriculture, while it oftentimes, as Mike and, and, and he probably know, that takes the brunt of criticism about the impact on environment, there's been so much progress by great um, farmers like McMahon's that we really have to appraise uh, them to take to see what they have done based on their own experience their own generation of their knowledge and what they're going through on their farms to reduce their their environmental footprint and we have just in the agriculture community come leaps and bounds in the last 20 years it's just been absolutely amazing as we've targeted sustainability and and resilience so i just like to say that um um, I think we need to, to give farmers the credit. They're the largest group of land owners on, and land managers on earth. And um, we, um, uh, we have to do everything we can to support them in the great practices that they're, they're putting forward. Uh, thank you, Sally. Anybody else kind of with final thoughts on those last two topics? Otherwise we'll get into kind of moving from one to the other. Uh, kind of what we try to do in all these uh, uh, speaker series uh, sessions is kind of any, any advice, any uh, uh, challenges, uh, calls to action, uh, particularly to the students uh, that are in the audience. Uh, maybe we can start with Mike and Edie. You guys deal with plenty of students, uh, as you said, that are coming down on, you know, kind of whatever comes into their mind <laughs> from Cornell, Syracuse, uh, the research that's going on, the test case uh, study. Uh, any any call to action or any any challenge uh, to to our next generation of leaders? I just, I'm I'm always asked to to impart some words of wisdom right. by the yeah. uh, one of the professors and, and I I just over the years my best advice seems to be that I see these students there at Cornell they're at a, a wonderful land grant college and and there are wonderful land grant colleges all over this country. Build connections with your faculty and your peers, uh, you know, and, and make them strong so because they will serve you so well. I know I know we seem connected uh, social media wise and everything, but build those personal connections with the people who can be your mentors and your support and your and your sources of, of information as you go out into the world or whether you're going into government, whether you're going back to the farm or into industry, private industry, just take advantage of those years where you're there and with all this rich availability of uh, support and great minds. Thank you. Uh, Cedric, any challenge, any thoughts? Mike, I don't know if you wanted yeah. to chime in uh, with, from what Edie said and then we'll go to Cedric. Uh, she's the brains of the operation. <laughs> <laughs> Wisely spoken. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, I mean, you're close in mindset and age to, you know, to the students. Uh, you certainly inspired them today, uh, you know, with your story and what you've accomplished. Kind of anything else that you're that you're seeing and, and, and kind of in your daily interactions with fellow students. Yeah, so something I can tell them is that um, it's just, uh, let me ask you, like, it's, a, it's around the two questions. One question is uh, if someone asks you what is your dream job versus another person asks you what impact do you want to make in your lifetime? I, I think these are two questions, but there are two different questions, but we, you know, we tend to get consumed by dream jobs and focusing on dream job will lead to disappointment. Uh, what I can tell them is that anybody who is listening or whoever will listen later is that your potential is infinite. 
and it is always bigger than whatever problems you are going through. Every one of us was born with the purpose. And if you are here, you matter. You need one thing, to have one important thing to become whatever you want to become or to achieve what, whatever you want to achieve in your lifetime, in your life. So that one important thing is responsibility. Be responsible for all your actions and listen to your mentors and then follow your heart. Don't follow your, the cloud and stop thinking about dream jobs, but instead focus on finding your, your life purpose, how you want to live your life and the impact you want to make or achieve in your lifetime. And the biggest question you should always carry in your mind is, what do I really want to do? What do I have to offer? And the answer to that is you making sure that everything you do moves to the right direction and the vision is set. And when you do that, the forces of life will rise to meet you. And my message to all of you is that don't just aspire to make a living, aspire to make a difference. And always keep in mind that to make a difference is not what is in your pocket that matters. It is what is in your heart that truly matters. Thank you. Thank you. Well said. Chris? Roger, I think that if, if I was able to add one thing, it would be that you're never too old to learn. And I'm an example of that. <laughs> uh, and keep, keep an open mind, you know, um, we're doing things that my father never would have thought that mm. you should do on a farm. And, um, and my CFO here next to me can tell you that it's been good, uh, not only, you know, for the environment, for, but for the, but for the pocketbook as well. Otherwise we couldn't do it. So, um, and, and take advantage of the fact that those who decide to go into production agriculture, take advantage of the land grant colleges that we have because they're always looking for farms to try new things and new ideas on. And, uh, you know, the, the best and the brightest are there and, and uh, you can take that leap of faith and it can end up to be a very positive experience. Yeah, thank you very much, Mike. And I hear you on you're never too old to learn. I note that both of us are creeping whiteness in our, in our goatees. And so uh, kind of well done on that. I prefer to think that it gives us a distinguishedness, right? Yeah, it's kind of the wisdom that we're continuing to learn and realize that we don't know everything, which is certainly why I continue with my journalism, my book writing. I'm taking notes here as you all are top, talking as I figure, yeah, this is something I need to look for. And a lot of the questions that are coming, you know, also on continued, you know, I don't know if you're seeing any of them or if you want to reply to to any of the questions that we're not going to be able to get to because we're coming to an end uh but on the food waste on, on food loss on this whole kind of environmentalist mentalism and kind of what's going on with the land and the soils and certain and waters and in some parts of the world uh krista over to you for any for any final challenge uh, well, well final thoughts i kind of started with thanking the the students for their engagement and involvement and i'll end there and i'll just remind them in a general sense of how a lot of young people, I've worked with a lot of young people in government, non-government, there are kind of three things I always look for and it's just general advice. It's your character, your curiosity and your commitment. And it can, no matter where, what you choose, what life's path you choose, what job, what profession, wherever you choose to go, your character, your curiosity and your commitment. Those three things, if you know and understand yourself well enough, to be able to talk about and live those three things, I think you'll be successful. Thank you. Also wise words uh, uh, to adhere to. Uh, Dr. Rocky, we'll leave uh, final final thoughts or call the Yeah, I, I would just um, encourage the students to uh, broaden their experiences to the extent possible. I know you have to say no at times, but to the diverse experiences, whether it be working with different types of farmers, whether it be on different types of committees, getting some internship with, with a, a group that you would otherwise think isn't related to your field, that really prepares you for the future because um, in, in the case we need bright, talented people, this is, I, I mean, I have so much pride in, in the young people that are in agriculture right now and I know that our future is bright. So take every advantage of every experience you can possibly have while you're in school because it's going to, to serve you well when you get out. Thank you. And I'll just, in closing, 
echo all those thoughts, uh, second those motions, and repeat what I had said uh, earlier, perhaps a couple times, that we all can make a difference in this. So again, no matter what your skill set is or what you're studying or as your passions develop, if this is something that really moves you, inspires you, finally, conquering hunger and malnutrition and dealing with this imperative of, of how we move uh, forward in, in nourishing the planet as we've been talking about, and, but also saving the planet and, and all the environmentalism and sustainability, you all can make, a, can make a difference. So with that, we'll hand it back to Tricia to close us out and propel us forward. Well, I just wanna say thank you again to all the students who have participated with us and all the people that have joined us today and in particular to our amazing panelists and those beautiful closing words, very quotable. I was also taking lots of notes um, the entire time. So we wanna thank um, our sponsors who you know, make this kind of programming possible. And we also want to make sure and invite you all to our next segment of our series, which will take place on uh, the 28th of April. And with this one, we'll be taking a step to look at the evolving relationship between consumers and food, really looking at the notion of a personal food footprint and the complexity of that and the way that people are viewing their food in a much more complex and personal way. And COVID has really put an exclamation mark on that. So it'll be a really fun um, discussion that we're gonna have with lots of exciting organizations from the private sector and, and some research organizations as well. So please join us again. and. Thank you again to our remarkable panelists and our um, fabulous keynote, Dr. Rocky. We appreciate you guys and your ongoing support of Farm Journal Foundation. So thank you. Everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.